what I'm going to share is, is to God be the glory. Yeah. This is a special time of year. Uh, Pastor Miller was talking last week and talked about closing. And in the closing, he mentioned, you know, doing things and, and planting a seed and not, you know, we plant, we water, but God gives the increase. That's our whole responsibility. And it was about this time of the year, my sister, back in 1972, uh, she was a junior in high school. Uh, was, we were, I was a senior. And uh, our family was a good family, but we weren't a safe family. We went to church, and uh, my sister was, somebody put a tract, and we passed her, Miller mentioned it, you, you never know what's gonna happen. Someone put a tract, my sister was, had a, a Christmas job to open envelopes, people turning in coupons to be redeemed. And she opened it up and someone placed a tract in there. And we were typical high school kids, a typical family in 1972. And I remember walking in the house one day and my mom was crying, sitting on her bed. And I said, what's the matter, mom? And she goes, I don't know what's happening to our family. There were, there were six, six children. My sister, she got the tract. And she knew somebody who had a testimony in our high school. And she says, she's talked about this. I know she can explain this to me. And she took that tract. Now a tract, how many of you handed out tracts? Mm -hmm. A tract. She, she, she took that to this girl, Holly Glazing. And Holly Glazing explained to my sister the plan of salvation. Amen. And my sister accepted Christ as her Amen. Savior. And she changed. She changed so much that my mom noticed it. Everybody noticed it. And my mom, for the next couple of weeks, kept walking into her bedroom, asking her questions. And finally, my sister looked at us and says, Mom, is there something you want? And my mom says, I want what you have. Amen. I want what you have. And my mom accepted Christ as her savior. My dad, and my sister says, I'm gonna go get baptized. And my, my dad says, no you're not, you were baptized as a baby. And she goes, no dad, I'm gonna get baptized. And my mom said, Norm, let her go. And my sister went and got baptized. And my dad saw the change in my sister and my mom and on Palm Sunday in 1973, my dad went to church and he accepted Christ Amen. as his savior. He was an air traffic controller. And immediately, he went to the Methodist church that we were attending and he asked the preacher, why have you never told us about this? Why have you never shared this with us? My, I have five sisters. Cheryl got saved, my mom got saved, my dad got saved, and my other three sisters got saved. Robin and I were seniors in high school. And she was Catholic and I was nothing. And they kept witnessing to us. And we saw that. We saw the change. We graduated, as soon as I graduated, I said, we're getting married and we're moving away. They're all crazy. <laughs> And we did, we, we graduated, I went in the military, we got married and we went away and we were just, just, just what we wanted. But my mom and dad kept sending tracks to her. And I remember coming home, we were stationed at Minot Air Force Base and I came home. We got stationed there in December of 1973, 70, yeah, 73. And I came home in February, one day in 74, and my wife said, Robin, I've read the tract and I've accepted Christ. Amen. He's my savior. I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> With a bunch of my friends, and they, they were, we, we all, in the military, you have what they call dream sheets. You can fill out where you, and who liked being in Minot, North Dakota? The state tree is a telephone pole. <laughs> the wind blows all the time. It's cold. And 
I put in to go with a bunch of buddies, and we put in to, and we, Southeast Asia, and we went to Thailand. And when I was there, the Lord got me lost. And when I came home, my wife had been attending Bible Institute at Fourth Baptist Church, where my dad had gone to seminary. And she had grown in the Lord. And the first thing that we had to do was find a church. And we found a good local church called Bible Baptist Church up in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, right outside the military base. And it was there that I heard the gospel message and responded to it. And in 1977, March, I accepted Christ as my Savior. But here's the part of the story, the track. The person that put that track in, my mom and dad, our family tree from my mom and dad, there's 103 of us. There's six siblings, we're all married, our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, there's 103. Every one that understands the gospel has made a profession of salvation. Amen. There are some in the ministry, pastoring. They've gone to Maranatha, Pillsbury, I went to Pillsbury, Bob Jones, Ambassador, and Pensacola. We've almost got them all covered. <laughs> but my dad is a missionary. My dad went to seminary. And as a result of God's leading, the grace of God and the mercy of God, the sovereignty of God, my dad has been able to be a church planner in Minnesota. And then God led him to Dr. Chelly, Dr. Chelly, where he helped in the Bible college over there. And then he saw something. The, the graduates weren't going in the ministry, they were going in the call centers. The graduates weren't going out and ministering, so the Lord laid on my heart, on my dad's heart, we're gonna take these men and we're gonna start churches. And God has used my dad since he was 55, he's now 84, he's still actively a missionary in India. He says he'll retire when God takes him home. Amen. And they minister now, there's been over over 50 churches started, and this ministry has been going on, and God, to God be the glory that those churches are planning, and the ministry, the, the great commission is being fulfilled. The gospel is being spread, souls are being saved, individuals are being baptized and discipled, and churches are being reestablished. One tract. One tract. What are we doing? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. To God be the glory. And we had that conversation because of Andrew bringing Peter. Amen. You know, that's, that's what it amounts to. Just one person. You ever get tired of getting advertisements for this credit card or that sort of thing? There's a way to just not get tired of that. Turn it into a ministry. Amen. Randy Pike uh, oftentimes will take those things that have an envelope in them that are already stamped, metered out, and he puts a track in them and sends them back to the company. You get tired of people doing telemarketing and calling you? Listen to their spill and then say, now let me tell you something. Turn it into a ministry if you have the time. And there's a lady in our church, a member in our church here, that telemarketers, that's her opportunity to reach lost people. And I've, I've, I've at times done that. You know, and people say, well, hey, I, I didn't call you to talk to you about this. Well, you called me. You, why don't you, I've got something that's free. You're selling me something that's going to cost. Now, one track, my best friend in undergraduate uh, was Wally Jaworski, GFA missionaries to Australia since 1975. And his mom was saved, his dad was unsaved, and she would leave tracks around the house. And it was through a track that he saw, I think, on a nightstand. He decided, I'm gonna read that thing my wife's reading and put it in his lunch pail and went to work. Yes, he came back a different man, eventually, a track. Now you say, well, how often does that happen? Well, one time they did a survey. They figured for every 500 tracks put out to people, that, like free, don't know them, you don't, you don't know who you're speaking to or handing a track to, 
One person gets saved every 500 tracks. Okay? So make it your business that uh, you, you do more than 500 in one year, all right? <laughs> really. Okay. That's a wonderful testimony. And isn't it wonderful about it, uh, the family, and what God did through his sister coming to the Lord? That's encouraging, isn't it, Brother Butler, with your lost family? Well, we are going to uh, go to John chapter 1 again. And everybody have a handout. Does anybody need a handout? Please raise your hand if you don't have a, a handout. We're talking about a world belief and practice. And we, in light of the biblical worldview that we have that deals with <clears throat> uh, epistemology, theology, anthropology, cosmology, you just name it. And that's what Ken Funk, we've looked at that over and over again, and I keep repeating, but the seven things connected with a worldview, whether it's biblical or secular worldview. Metaphysics is one of them, and this is a heavy section that answers many of the epistemology or metaphysical questions that people have about our world. And in John's Gospel, we already saw that First, out of the box, we saw the eternality of Jesus Christ and God the Father. John 1.1 1, 1 talks about, in the beginning was the Word. And that what word was is a to be verb that talks about an imperfect tense that means in the continued being, the continued existence in the past, of this one when, before all things began in creation. So it's the eternality of Christ, we saw that. But we also saw the equality of Christ with God the Father in the next phrase in John 1.1, 1, 1, and it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We looked at that preposition with its pros and it means face to face. It's the face to face preposition. And we said, when you get face to face, you're on equal levels. You're equal plane. God the Father and God the Son are equally God. But there's an intimacy involved in it. There's two persons. You have face to face, you have to have two persons. In this trinity, we have Three persons, but two persons that are being referred to are God the Father and God the Son. And there's an equality, but there's also an intimacy. It's as close as being face to face. A fellowship. Think about the eternal fellowship of God the Father and God the Son. What a joyful fellowship. You, you enjoy fellowshipping one, with one another. I enjoy Christian fellowship. With my wife, I enjoy fellowship. But think of the, the Trinity, the family of the Trinity, is the archetype of all fellowship that we experience. And John's Gospel eventually is going to show how Jesus as a son is the model of models to be a son. Whatever my father, father says, I do. Whatever he tells me, I speak. Whatever he asks me to do in sacrifice, I sacrifice. I obey him, my father. My father and I are one. Now you think about that just for a moment. And our families are simply a takeoff of the Trinity family when we look at it. And so equality and intimacy... And that great fellowship of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then we come down and he says after verse 2, and in the beginning was the, the Logos with the Father from the very beginning. He repeats the emphasis of verse 1 and in verse 3. And then he comes and he shows the agency of the Logos or the Son. And you see that in verse 3. Look at it with me there. And it says something about creating all things. What is it? It says, by him were all things created. And there was nothing that was made that was not made by him. So that tells us matter and the universe is not eternal. 
Contrary to what the Mormons say, that matter is eternal, and many philosophers have tried to say in the theory of evolution, matter has always been here. There wasn't necessarily a Big Bang. Matter is eternal, and we just have the development of matter. Now, right here it states the answer to cosmology, where did it come from? By Jesus Christ, the agency that God the Father used was God the Son. Colossians 1, what does it say? By him were all things made, and for him were all things made. So he's the agent, and, but he's also the one that's the intended end to get the glory for the creation. So when we look out and we sing, this is our Father's world, it's also his Son's world. You remember that. And the Holy Spirit's also involved in that, and we know the whole Trinity. So there is the agency, but we also have the reality of being that we saw here in verse 4. If you look at verse 4 in John 1, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now life, is we talking about biological life or eternal life? And the answer is yes. Okay, <laughs> yes, he is the one that it, in him we move and have our being. As Paul told the Stoics, that were the ones that had problems with this issue of matter. Where did it come from? And right there is the answer. All life, the life force, physical vitality is from the sun. That's the origin, but he also maintains it. By him all things consist. And the word consist in Colossians, what does that mean? It means by him all things hold together. Do you realize if Jesus took his hand off of it and said, no longer am I going to keep it together, we would have an atomic meltdown today of the universe. But he keeps his hand on it and by him we live and move and have our being, but the whole universe by him moves and has its being today and is held together. So we have the fact that he is the reality behind all being. He's the force. Not as the philosophers would say, just the mind for a logos, or not just the Hebrews, the personality and power, but he is the one that is the reality behind all of the being. You know, science fiction talks about what? The force, right? Uh, he is the force, and he is the being, but he's the reality behind it all. And then we go on to see, as we go through this, that there's a humility about Christ. And we want to talk about that a little bit, about he's the life and he's the light. You know, maybe I ought to make reference to that. So, What does it mean to be light? Literally, we could use one word, clarity. You want to mark down a word next to this? Clarity. What do, we, what do we do with light? If you have no light, where do you go? I don't move. <laughs> I don't want to fall over something and break a bone at this age. You understand what I'm saying? I want to have a light, even if it's just a back hall light. Something that will let me see where I'm going and if there's any objects in the way. Because we don't have clarity. Well, Jesus Christ is life, but he's also, that life is the light of men. And I want to just say that the light of men means that it has to do with being able to see clearly what or whom. In the context here, it's being able to see the Father clearly. He's the light that makes clear who God the Father is and how he looks. Jesus told people, what did he say? You that have seen me have seen, yeah, the Father. So he manifests or makes clear the Father, but he does also something for men. Now it says here in verse five, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Now this word comprehend can be taken in two ways. Sometimes it's used to mean to understand 
and grasp it with the mind to understand. But the other one is to grasp a hold of it and put it down and overcome and conquer. Well, what's the answer? Yes. Okay, there it is again. The world does not, and the darkness, the dark people with dark minds that have not the light cannot see God clearly. Can't see him at all. Can't understand, can't comprehend him. But on the other hand, when people see Christ and the light and they don't want him, they do what Brother Jeff was talking about. I want to get away or I want to shut it down. I want to get rid of it. I want to overcome it. I want to prove it's wrong. And I bet if there was a point in time you wanted it to be so that God did not exist and Christ wasn't real and you didn't need him. Right. Three or four years. But you can't overcome him. You can't obliterate him. You can't obliterate his light. Now stop and think about where we get light from. Have you ever stopped to think about this? Where do we get light? God is going to judge us according to the amount of light we have as human beings. But have you ever stopped to think about where we get light that reveals God? Brother Butler. Creation. Creation. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Okay, give me another one. The word of God, God, scripture. All right, you get light there. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's light. Okay, other things. Pardon? Leading of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. He illuminates, doesn't he? Okay, Brother Butler. Okay, we are a light, not to be hid under a bushel, right? (laughs) Yes, so we are lights. Okay, give me another one. Who's the light of the world? That's who we're talking about. That's going to come up in John. But there's some other things that give light. The church. The church, all right, okay. The church is to give light. Let's keep going. There's another light that is not outside of us. And it's called conscience. Romans talks about they that don't have the law or the scriptures without the law that is written in their heart. So there is a conscience that brings forth a light, but people try to shut down their conscience, don't they? And extinguish the light if they don't want to be told they need to change. Okay. Well, we've we've covered some. Now let's get back to to John chapter 1. So there we see that there is a light that shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended not. And so here is a Christian now that's going to be light bearer. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Who are we talking about? The guy that wrote the Gospel of John? Who? You're shaking your heads. Who is it? Yeah, John the Baptist. Okay, so distinguish between those two. We have John the Apostle that wrote this Gospel and John the Baptist. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came forth to be a witness, to bear witness of the light. A bearer of light or a witness of light. He's not the light that all men through him might believe. So he wants through Christ all to believe on God, the light. And so we see the images of Christ. He's Lagos. He's life. He is light. And then what are we going to see next about him? He's a lamb. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. But we want to come back to this, and I want to just get back to where we're at. He's the revealer of hearts of men and the Father's person. That's number six. We put clarity there, humility. Humility is when we come to this point, and he says, He was not that light, in verse 8, but sent to bear witness of that light. 
That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh in the world. And it's talking of Christ being one that shines light into everyone that is born. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. You remember what we said about Sidlow Baxter's comments about this? We're trying to review here this morning. But we said, Sidlow Baxter said of John 1 and verse 10, the, the supreme th truths found in John 1.10 are this. First of all, it says, <coughs> excuse me, I got to get to the right page here. It says the supreme uh, truth about our earth is the statement, the world was made by him. That's the most significant thing about earth and this universe is Jesus made it, okay? The other thing he said, he was in the world, that is the supreme fact of history. The fact of what we're getting ready to celebrate here at Christmas season is the supreme fact of the history of this earth. God came to be on this earth. To live on this earth as a human being. That is the supreme uh, fact of past history. But the world knew him not. That is the supreme tragedy of human depravity. Think about it. He came to Israel. Now when it says in the next verse there it says. He came unto his own. That word own, it means someone's possession. And it's where we get the word idios or idiot. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus is an idiot. It's an idiot is someone that has a peculiar trait or a peculiar possession or peculiar, their own unique personality, right? Now, we heard of some idiots this morning at the beginning of the message, did we not? Uh, ro Russian roulette with a, a Glock. <laughs> you know, that's an idiot, isn't it? All right. He has his own personality. He's stupid more than anybody else. All right. Now, in this case, own is a neuter in the Greek, and it's talking about Jesus' nation, his land, and his hometown, his temple, his world. He came to his own. And then it says, but his own received him not. That word own is the same word idiot, but it's not in the neuter gender. It is in the masculine gender. And what it's referring to, he came unto his own people, Israel. And they knew him not. Okay. They rejected him. You know, think of about it. I, I think of whenever he had been baptized and then he was in the wilderness and then where he went to his hometown. Do you remember where, what happened when he went to his hometown and they were there? And he said, Isaiah 61, I am the one that's predicted in this passage. I've come to set the prisoners free. And today this is fulfilled. I'm here. And they said, oh, yes, we've been waiting for the Messiah. Come, we'll make you our king right here. No, they'd keep the Roman garrison that was actually there. That's why Nathaniel said, can anything come good out of Nazareth? Because they had a Roman garrison and they were considered a Gentile accepting and embracing power of Caesar embracing town. <laughs> what did they try to do with him? Do, do you remember? Yeah. They tried, yeah. Yes, and I remember going with our tour guide four years ago in March. And Reuben is his name. He's a Jew and he knows the Bible. But he doesn't know the Lord. And I remember him walking us up that trail, up to that ledge where they tried to push Jesus off. And he explained the New Testament story. 
that this is what they would try to do with this man they called Jesus Christ. And I can remember walking from that site with him alone while others were trailing and trying to tell him about Jesus Christ and he knew him not. And he didn't want him. Reuben, named after the first son. You understand what I'm saying? Still today, he's blind. The light is not in him. And if you think of it, pray for Reuben. He needs this one that's the light that made that hill that they tried to push him off of. Hmm. But now we go on and we see this. Not only that, but there's a humility about him. He condescended because he came to the world and we see that he was full of charity. Full of charity. And what does that mean? It says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. His own people, but as many as received him. And we come to this point and we say, hallelujah chorus. That's us. But as many or any that received him, what did he give? He gave us the legal right to be a family member of God. And that's what we're looking at. That word power there. Many has believed on him. To them gave he power. It's the Greek word exousia, which means right or authority. And we have the legal right, the legal document. And what is that legal document? It's him. <laughs> we have Christ. We received him. And so the response we should take in light of the worldview that he came to save and gave himself so he could give us that liberty or that authority of being sons of God, we ought to believe him and receive him. And that's the response practically that he says will do the job which were born, born again, this is talking about a spiritual birth, not his birth, but were born not of what? Blood, parental ancestry. How, you know, re recently you talked to someone and they said, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, how are you a Christian? Oh, my parents. I was born in a Christian family. That's what he's saying here, not by blood human blood, ancestry, nor of the will of the flesh, not by the power, not just parents or patriarchal Christianity, but not by power of my efforts, the flesh, my natural human being, I can't be born again by it either, my own personal efforts, nor by the will of man, the plan of man, I've got my plan. You know, if man planned salvation, what would it involve? Everybody that's unsaved, it's their plan. I'm gonna work my way there. Self-exaltation, self-effort works salvation. That's the plan of man. And God says, no, it's not by the plan of man, it's by my plan. And you know it's of God because it doesn't match up with man or natural man's plan. And so we see that. And then he goes on and says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we see in this statement, obviously, the incarnation. God in flesh. That's what incarnate means, to be in flesh. And it's God in flesh. But I've stated it here on this, on number 11, Shekinah. What is the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament? When we talk about the Shekinah glory or the Shekinah, what is that referring to? Shekinah means dwelling or settling, tenting or tabernacling. It's a temporary settling. That's the idea, and that's what this word means here in the Greek as well. It has a sound like Shekinah, the Greek, when it says, and he dwelt. And so he temporarily dwelt, and he was dwelling with men, why? To reveal the glory of the Father. He dwelt among us. He tended amongst us. Uh, but he wasn't going to live here permanently. But you stop and think about this. 
but he does have permanent humanity today in heaven. Think about this. Jesus in heaven. Sometimes we think he is God in heaven, but he's also human in heaven. Have you ever stopped to think about that? He didn't leave his human body here on earth. Eternally identified with us human beings so he could rescue us and be our permanent intercessor. Think of that one. Today he's a human and, a, and God in, in the flesh in heaven. Wow, for us. Oh, hallelujah. In our place he came to do this on earth. It reminds me of the story of the New York farmer during the Civil War. He was drafted, but this man's wife had recently died and he had young children that he was responsible for. But he was going to go serve in the Civil War. But a man in that area that had no family, no dependents, heard about this man being drafted and he went to him and he said, I will take your place and go fight in your place so you can stay and take care of your dependents. Wow. And that man, he said, well, I guess so. I need to take care of my children. I will accept that. And that man went off to war in the Civil War and in the first battle was killed by one shot or shot and killed. That farmer... When he heard that news, he came all the way down to that battlefield, got the man's body, took him to his churchyard, and buried him, and put on the tombstone, died in my place. Is that not what our Savior did? Died in my place. The vicarious atonement. The Lord Jesus Christ for us. Oh, the humility and the charity that's involved in that. But the glory of it. The glory of it. And he's manifesting the glory of God the Father, begotten Son of God. Now, I want to talk about that phrase here in verse 14. And the Logos was made flesh. And he took on human nature and dwelt among us, tabernacled amongst us, or Shekinahed. And we beheld the glory. And who... Who's writing this, John? Maybe he's thinking that day they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. John was there. Peter was there. You remember the, who was there? And what happened to Jesus? Oh, his visage was changed. He was, and he saw his majesty and glory. Boy, and he never got over. And the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he'd seen that glory. Visually and experientially in his own heart, he had seen grace and truth of God, only begotten. Now, people get that phrase and say, oh, that means Jesus was born. He's a created being. God the Father produced him. You know, like the Jehovah Witnesses say that he was Michael the archangel brought back in human flesh. Or some other factor like the Mormons would say, only begotten, monogenous. Okay, two Greek words. What does mono mean? What do you think of when you think of mono? You think of sickness, don't you? Kissing disease. <laughs> the kissing be right? That virus that you get if you kiss somebody that has that virus? <laughs> now you're sick. <laughs> I better not go there, all right? I'm constraining myself today. Somebody, a lady, I think, chided C.H. Spurgeon for uh, using too much humor in his preaching. And she chided and said, lady, if you knew how much uh, I constrain myself, the humor that I want to speak, that I don't speak, you would not be chiding me. You would be commending me. <laughs> and that's the way I am too, all right? I have to be careful on that, Okay. But it is this, mono. That means alone or only or unique, the only one. 
And genus means species or kind. He's the only kind that has this father-son relationship. Yes, he's always been with the father as the son. Eternal. That's what that word drives at. And then we go on to see John be, bear witness of him and cried saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me, is preferred before me. He was before me. There, once again, the eternality of Christ. He was before me. Hey, John the Baptist, when was he born and when was Christ born? Six months apart. Six months apart. Who's the oldest? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So what's he referring to? His physical being? No. His eternal existence as a spirit being before he received a body. He's before me. Confessing his eternality. And of his fullness have we received grace for grace. Oh, he's full. And that word full means to be complete or controlled by. To be filled by the spirit. That means you better jump up on these chairs and shout hallelujah and swing on the chandeliers and all of that. Is that what it means to be filled with the spirit? Mm -mm. Filled with the spirit means to be controlled by the spirit. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Controlled under the control of the alcohol? No. Be under the control of the Spirit. And he does it by the Word of God. But Jesus was controlled by grace and truth. Complete, full in grace and truth. Now, it says this. It says... Grace for grace. Now what's he driving at when he says grace for grace? Have you ever thought about that? If you haven't, you're going to now. Pile up on two. Grace upon grace. Yeah, grace upon grace. Literally the Greek word for that, where it says grace for, that preposition is where... We get the word anti or anti. And it means grace instead of grace. Anti. Now think of that one just a moment. What's he driving at when he says grace instead of grace? The replacement grace. You use up this grace, and then God gives you more grace that you need for where you're at. He adds. You know, it's kind of like when we go to the restaurant. I, how many, are any of you going to go out to eat with us today in, as a class? I, do you know about it? Okay, we haven't even, I guess we haven't announced it. Last Sunday of the month, if you want to, you can do that. See the fields afterwards. But you know what happens down here in the south? You can never get your tea glass empty in most southern restaurants. You just got it taken care of, and it gets down about third, and who, what happens? She comes over, yeah, fills it up with that sugary, syrupy southern tea, right? <laughs> and you gain five more pounds with that glass, all right? But you catch what I'm saying? She keeps refreshing the glass is what they call it, right? So it never gets empty. Folks, that's the way I look at grace that he's talking about here. You had this grace, now you use this grace, and God just comes in and pours more grace on it. You can never get the grace in your heart emptied. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it's, when I preach Titus 2, verses 11 through 13, this is what I think. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, disciplining us, that we should deny all ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly and justly and righteously in this present world, looking on what? That blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. So I want to, I want to end with this thought and a song. All right. You say, are you going to sing? Yep, I'm going to sing and everybody's going to leave. That's how I dismiss my meetings. <laughs> no. 
I picture the grace of God in that passage, like going to the beach. Did any of you go to the beach Thanksgiving? We usually go during the fall or winter time. We don't go down with those that broil in their juices on the beach, all right? <laughs> we, we go and we watch the waves and we look, like to pick up shells. You know, that's what we do. But I love to watch the ocean, don't you? Wave after wave, wave after wave. It just keeps coming. That's the way God's grace is. The grace of God brought salvation, our justification in Christ. But not only another wave of grace, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, the grace of sanctification. That's the next wave that comes. And then what is the next wave that comes in? Looking for that blessed hope. Why? By the grace of God. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the grace of glorification. Grace added to grace after to grace, or day by day grace, whichever you like, it's there. Now, having said that, I want to think of a song, and you're going to help me with this song. He giveth more grace. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you sang that song? He giveth more grace. Does anybody have that memorized? I was just thinking about that a few minutes ago, that song. That's the song that's come to my mind. And I, I, if, if nobody has it, I'm going to read the words to you here, all right? I forwarded this to my email. If my email will come up here in this dead spot, all right? We don't always plan on that. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Yeah, all right, we're going we're gonna to look at it just in closing here today. It's on timelesstruths.org. Uh, hopefully it'll come up. All right. All right, here's what it says. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To add affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted the store of our endurance, when our strength has failed, ere the day is half done, when our strength has failed, or the day is half done, when the, we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no mercy. His power, no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, there it is, his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your son that's so infinitely rich and in how he shares his riches with us in grace and truth. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning. <coughs> And through this season, may we come to love you more, speak of you more often, and share your grace with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.